If you are new to our channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether on those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, or anywhere in between, I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, gardening partner. Holly Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is the destination for all things gardening. Over 1,200 garden videos, short and long format, including full length in-studio video and podcast form of this show on iTunes, Stitcher, Podomatic, TuneIn, and a variety of other platforms that uh, sometimes we don't know we're even on. Uh, you can also find segments and individual interviews of this particular program on the Highlight tab. Well, you can contact us during the program in a number of ways. One is the uh, uh, email at twvgshow at gmail.com. Twitter handle is twvgshow. Or the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Ivy, or- and Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, Fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivorganics.com. You can call in at 414-444-5250. Uh, programming note, not, not really a programming note, a, a talk note. Uh, we're going to start up some of our uh, talks this year. Again, the we're going to be at the Franklin Public Library this uh, Tuesday, Tuesday at, at 10 p.m. At 7 p.m. At 7 p.m. And we're going to be talking about basics of canning. So um, it's a we we talk about canning safely and um, kind of how to can. We don't make anything, but definitely talk about the, the very basics of canning. So we have that on on Tuesday, and um, so uh, that's all we have this week right. for talks, and it's free to attend. And it's free to attend. You want to come and, and it's learn at seven p.m. At the it's not really a demonstration; it's more of a walk through. Right. It's like a, it's educational. Right. So, well, that being said, let's get into the program. We're going to talk about weeding the garden. Uh, there's a lot of techniques in which you uh, people will weed, uh, and sometimes they don't do it quite right. Right. So weeding is obviously important for your garden because weeds can choke out your plants possibly and weeds the reason why this occurs is weeds uh have three different ways of propagating right Mm -hmm. so one is they can propagate by the roots they can propagate propagate by their seeds the reproductive seed cycle and what's the third way and by rhizomes. Oh, rhizomes. So, and, and some plants can do all three. That's the thing. They will outcompete your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, your lettuce, because those plants are only basically have one means of reproductive system, and that's the, the seeds. And these other plants, they will choke them out uh, and compete with nutrients in water as well. So one is you can simply... Um, pull the weeds. Pull the weeds. Okay, so when you pull the weeds, though... You want to make sure you're removing the roots, not just pulling the weed. Okay, the weed's the gone. The top is gone. The top is gone. But very little root structure. You, is, and yeah. you know when you do this because you pull it out and you kind of feel it snap or break. And most of the time you'll be like, oh, well, whatever. You know, I'll go on to the next one. But if you're looking for some sort of permanent or semi-permanent solution, pulling Re- that reduction root out. Reduction of weeds. Of weeds yeah. Pulling that root out is, is going to help you. Because if you leave a small chunk or portion or segment of that root in the ground, it will regrow. We've seen this happen over and over again. There's many plants that will propagate from root cuttings. So you just leave you know, a half inch or a f- fragment in the ground, it will regrow. regrow. And you, when, if weeded properly, when the soil is damp and the soil will fall off the, the root, you can actually see in some of these plants where... The, the plant is growing in, in the spot, and then you pull it out, and that root is six, seven, eight inches underground, and it has started to germinate another growth tip that is piercing through the soil away from the parent plant. It's like a daughter plant, essentially. And it will regrow, and it will continue to, to walk itself across the, the, the garden or wherever you're at, under the ground, pop up, under the ground, pop up. So we want to remove. And, that, and people say, well, I till every so often. And when I till, I have more weeds in two weeks than I did before. Well, that's because you're chopping the roots up. Now, st- sitting there and digging the roots out with a trowel or a garden fork, purging the beds, it's a tedious process, not for everybody. I get but that. But it's definitely something if you want to reduce weeds, if, you want, if you're planning on 
using that space as a garden for a long time and you want to become efficient in your weed reduction and you're growing, it's something that you could invest your time in. If you want to limit the amount of weeds that you need to pull are raised beds, containers, giant grow bags, straw bales. Those are your... Uh, there are a little bit. Uh, the raised beds is an upfront cost with a long in long time payout because you the minimal amount of weeds because you're bringing in good compost, good potting mix, whatever the case is, the, whatever purple cow mixture you want to put in the raised bed. You're putting that in there, and only weeds that you have is what's coming from the sky, from birds, air that you may you know blow mm-hmm. in. Uh, you can use chemical applications. But you need to be careful what chemical you're going to use for your weed control aspect. Right, definitely. So um, and we'll get to that in the next segment. But one thing you can use is called BioSafe. Mm-hmm. And BioSafe is a non-toxic uh, product. Um, not exactly 100% non-toxic, but it's safe. It, it is designed for organic gardening. It, the, the company has worked to limit the amount of impact it has on environmental aspects. Uh, there is a coupon code TWVG at checkout, save 10%. And they have a lot of other things besides just the weed killer. But it is designed for organic gardening, so it doesn't stay in the soil and increase the toxicity and cause other problems down the road. Right. So that's what BioSafe is. It's a spray. You can buy it in a concentrate or in a, um, a ready-to-spray form, but it is effective in killing the weeds. It doesn't kill the roots of the weeds, but it is effective in killing the weeds. And we have found from personal experience that sometimes you don't have to weed all the weeds in the garden. No. Now you might think, what you know, what are you what are you talking about? Sometimes lazy gardening is good gardening. Right. So sometimes you'll be weeding or you'll be walking through your garden and you see something like a thistle, which seem to be popping up everywhere now, um, or the ones that you Lamp, missed. Right. Um, are now getting nice and tall, and you'll find them, like, will be full of aphids or something. Some type of bug. Some type of bug. And so you don't want to pull that weed, because if you pull that weed, those bugs are going to go somewhere else, and, and prote- probably on your on your plants that you want to eat. So you might want to leave that weed. Be cautious now when you leave these weeds, because their job is to reproduce. Typically, they'll they'll get to a point where they'll put a big flower on, seeds and then those seeds will disperse all through your growing area so you can you know top uh, cut the top off and keep it from flowering just to allow that plant to continue to grow to attract those bugs away from the edible plants in which you're growing and attach them to that uh, host plant uh, to allow everything to be happy kind of have a a balanced harmony leave that weed in there that's attached that all these bugs are going to but trim the top off to keep it from reproduction of seeds uh, so you don't have a thousand more next year right so that is definitely um, an option if you're going to go in an area and and you can do this in your normal grow area too in a traditional ground garden if you have uh, designated areas in which you grow you can solarize the soil uh, if you have a lot of weeds and you want to try to go the easy route. So let's say you have a 3-foot by 10-foot area that you grow, and there you have several of those in the ground. And you can do this in raised bed, but, it's, again, we're bringing good soil, so we won't have this problem. So you're going to take black plastic, a, a good 6 mil black plastic. You're going to cover that grow area, put rocks, stones, bricks, logs, hold it down. What is occurring and what you're doing is solarizing. You're allowing the sun to intensely bake that soil. Don't worry about the worms. They'll go elsewhere. The microbial life, you can revitalize that very easily. But once that soil gets to a certain temperature, it kills off the weeds. It kills all the viable weed seeds in the soil because you're essentially putting that soil in a very hot oven and killing all of that. So then in two or three months, let's say you do that Ju- July 1st or, uh, and, and you leave that until September, pull that back, your weeding will be very easy next year. Uh, you can revitalize it by getting uh, manure tea, some compost, just draped uh, a couple inches of compost on top of that bed. You'll be uh, amazed at how easily uh, it has worked to weed that bed of those weeds without Especially physically doing Especially if you, if you have anything. something like Creeping Charlie. Um, it's very hard to eradicate that. So if you have a large area that you're like, I want to plant here, but there's all this creeping charling. And you don't want to use a chemical application. Right, and it has this just like web of roots underneath the soil. It's 
it's just how it grows, um, definitely will, that black plastic application will help. Yeah, keep it matted down because you want, don't want it to blow away. You want a thick black plastic, but not so much that heat, you know, if you get like a rubber mat, that's not going to work. That no, you just want like something like a, a black plastic garbage bag the, material. The rubber mat will work good for you the wall You can um, get something like that in rolls at like uh, your local big box uh, home store. Right. Uh, so weeding, it's a terrible task that many people have to perform. Some people don't do it at all. And, and there are some gardeners on YouTube that do not weed at all. And what they, what the, the end goal is, they plant their garden, they allow the weeds to take over. And then they save the seeds in which the plants that they've planted has survived and produced because they believe that that has created a stronger gene in the seed to outcompete those weeds in which they were growing with. It's possible. There's I don't have scientific proof no, of that. No, but plants do become more acclimated to each ecosystem, especially if you save the seeds year after year. But And when I, when I weed, I pull the weeds up and I lay them on the ground as a mulch. The sun bakes and they create a mat on top of the, the ground because all of our leaves that we brought in last year are gone. They've, they broke down, the soil has been fed with them. So I, I continue to pull the weeds up, lay them down as a uh, cut and uh, a mulch. They, they mm-hmm. call this cut and um, chop and drop. Chop but, and drop, yeah. But I'm pulling as many roots out as possible. But that's another way, instead of just putting the weeds in the compost pile or on the side. You sides, can also make something like the weed tea. Weed tea, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, 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 that we've done. So just a number of ways in which to weed. Again, you don't have to do this. Take a small portions. Don't try to do a 3,200-square-foot garden. Oh, my goodness. Try to do it in quadrants and in, in portions, and uh, it will do a little bit now. Uh, there's, a couple of, there's a saying, do a little, but do it often, and that works with the weeding up procedure. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about four chemicals that gardeners use in their garden that are not organic, what we don't recommend, and we'll tell you the reasons why right after this. Got a question? Email the show at twbgshow at gmail.com. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit Bobex.com. B O B B. Hoss Tools wants to help you grow your own food. From seed starting supplies, hand tools, drip irrigation, harvesting equipment, and a complete line of all-natural pest control solutions, they've got you covered. Keep your garden weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hose that are built to last a lifetime. And the Precision Garden Seeders have proven design for planting a wide variety of seeds. Hoss Tools has what you need to get the most out of your growing space, large or small. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at hostools.com. I know you're looking for an alternative to harsh chemicals, but you want professional strength products. BioSafe's Garden Line gives you just that. Professionally used for 20 years, available to homeowners. Organic solutions that are effective. They offer an array of eco-friendly products from plant food, fertilizer, to one-of-a-kind herbicides, organic weed killer. BioSafe's products can be used around children, pets, wildlife, so you can enjoy your yard more. Grow stronger, healthier with BioSafe. Find us on Facebook at BioSafe home and garden and visit us at biosafe.net to learn more get 10 percent off your next purchase at biosafe.net by using coupon code twvg at checkout flame engineering home of the weed dragon the perfect propane torch kit for home and garden use for killing weeds no need to pull or spray 100 other uses find out more at flameengineering.com purple cow organics quickly and naturally increases the uptake of nutrients and water to your plants with their new bioactive vegetable supercharger designed to meet the unique needs by helping the living organisms in the soil help plants uptake the nutrients more quickly through their roots and leaves find out more at purplecoworganics.com Bad smell and flower. This garden fun fact is sponsored by Minerti.com. Get your three pack today. Drop the tea bag in water. Let steep. Then feed your soil, not your plants. 100% organic. Find out more at Minerti.com. Always free shipping. One of the world's smelliest flowers is the Titan Arum. 
or the corpse flower. It's called this because it smells like rotting dead bodies. The blooms are 8 foot tall and 12 foot wide. It smells like rotting flesh to attract flies, which is their preferred method of pollination. People have also been known to pass out from the smell. The Gardener's Hollow Leg, the debris and harvesting bag you wear, comes with its own belt attachment, perfect for doing light pruning, weeding, harvesting on the ground or on a ladder, and many other uses. Find out more at thegardenershollowleg.com. Save 10% by using the word veggies at checkout. Pomona's Universal Pectin is high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar, honey, or any alternative sweetener you'd like. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Available at most natural food stores and online. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Flame Engineering, Eco Garden Systems, Bob X, Plant Success, Beans and Barley, MI Gardener, Outpost Natural Food Co-op, Root Assassin, Manure Tea, The Gardener's Hollow Leg. Find all sponsors at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. Check, check. Is anybody still listening? Anybody out there? Check, check. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. We all have problems in our garden. And sometimes ill informed or uneducated gardeners, weekend warriors, will just go to the garden center and see a product that is labeled weed killer or bug killer or specific, you know, problem in the garden. Like and this, ju- this helps X, Y, Z, hopefully. Right. And, and they yeah. pull it and they bring it home and they apply it. And whether it works or not, that's not really the conversation which uh, is important here. It's understanding the product in which we're using the end result that it has, not only for the environment in our garden, but how it affects us as human beings, our nervous system, our, our insides. And we're going to go over four products here. It's not that we're slamming the companies per se. It's that we want to inform you that these products exist and what the what they actually what happens to the plants, the bugs, you when using them and the environment. So the first one we want to talk about is seven, and it's spelled S E V I N. And a lot of people use this. Uh, um, down I when I grew up, where I grew up, and where I. I still will go and visit. Oh, we'll just put a little seven on this. That, that'll fix the problem. We'll get rid of these right. bugs. And uh, uh, people who consider themselves even organic gardeners that don't use Roundup or don't use pesticides or whatever, they still use seven. And it's it's not good. It's I don't know I don't know how it got known as it's okay for your plants because yeah okay it's it is safe for your plants. It's a it's typically a powder. Sometimes a spray, but it's typically a powder. And the problem is is that um, it's it's harmful to you and your pets. It's a most of the time people use the powder, and if you inhale that powder, it's not good for your lungs. It can cause things like com- convulsions and comas. Um, and and just based on your chem- your body chemistry, whether you inhale a lot or a little, it can have this effect. It is a nerve toxin yeah, agent. It's, it's a nerve toxin agent, which means that it can affect your nerves quite a bit and, and fast. So you're putting on, on your plants to kill Japanese beetles, uh, whatever the other cases, the other bugs there. Uh, not only is it going on your plants, it's going in the air. You've got possible pets uh, running through your garden. You've got your children that are eating these vegetables in which you're putting the powder on. And the other thing you need to be aware of, when you read the back of the instructions on the back of the bottle, which some people choose not to do because they feel, okay, I'll just sprinkle it on and be done, it says from application to harvest, you have to have 21 days of no harvest before it is deemed safe to harvest the product in which that was applied 21 days ago. Right. So, and I don't know about anybody else, but um, my niece and nephew they like vegetables. They know the vegetables come from the garden, and they are not 
opposed to going out there and on their, pick, own. On their own and picking a vegetable off the plant. Uh, my brother-in-law just picks onions at his leisure. So if you put this product in, on your plants and you have children or you have a spouse or roommate or a partner or whatever that is going to not wait 21 days to eat that, it could be problematic. So that's one. That's one. So keep that in mind. Another one is the the um, preen. There's a preen, which is a, a plant. Uh, it's um, it's a preen is um, it's used to as an herbicide. Okay. And so it's what it is is it's it's a non-emergent herbicide, which means that when bef- that most people put this down before the weeds come. So you plant your plants and then you apply this granular material around the plants to prevent the weeds from germinating. Right. Okay. So that's what you do. You just the problem spray with this application is... It's called... Um, it has a main ingredient. <laughs> it's hard to say. It's called trif- trifurulin. That's um, correct. And yeah. that's the ingredient. It's very harmful to aquatic life. So a lot of these... Any of these chemicals that are not deemed as um, by OMRI oh, right. or um, organic... They will cling to water molecules. They're not water soluble. They're they cling to water molecules. Bond to it and then travel they bond with to it the and then they travel with the streams and all of that. So you might think, okay, well, I don't have any. I don't have a fish pond in my backyard. No, you probably you a storm don't. Drain, don't. But you, you have a storm drain, um, and it's going somewhere. Uh, real quick, Omri, O M R I. When you see this on a label, what does that mean? It's it basically means that it's a it's a government certification that it's an organic type product. Uh, and, and you want to look for that, and that is the requirement that certified organic growers have to use in order for them to still stay certified organic, right. and that and that crop. Yeah. Um, the next one we have is called is called um, I don't really know how to say this, but it's uh, setho setho Yeah. And it's a selective herbicide that will kill only grassy type weeds. But, um, so I know like a lot of people will have something called Bermuda grass. I don't know if we have that here or not, but, um, I'm not really too concerned about grass. However, it does kill that grass. The Bermuda grass is, is aggressive and, um, it's kind of a, a stronger grass. So what it does is it does kill that. And however, just like a lot of Here's these other the ones. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with that, just killing that grass aspect of it. Yeah. So the problem is, is just like all the rest of these, it's harmful to you. It's harmful to your pets. It's harmful to your children. If you're not out applying at the right time, it's going to be something that is going to just spread. And, again, it gets into the waterways. It gets into your, if you have a septic system, it can cause problems there. So there's a lot of different um, dangers there. And, and then we want to talk about the, the, the elephant in the room. We all know what the weed killer is that everybody goes and buys for their sidewalk cracks, their patio pl- paver cracks. It's Roundup. Yeah, Roundup. So it's also known as glyphosate. And the problem with Roundup is that... It, okay, from from a, an aspect of what it is intended, the, the end result is, it's a phenomenal chemical to use. Oh, yeah, 100%. It, it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you have to be... First of all, you have to read the directions. And any of these chemicals, you have to read the directions. So a lot of people don't do that, or they just, oh, well, this is what my neighbor does, blah, blah, blah. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so you have to do it properly. And Roundup, you, if you spray it and it's above 70 degrees outside, it doesn't necessarily just only make direct contact with whatever you're spraying. It sits in the air and then it can Drifts. move. It becomes, it becomes airborne at that point, which is problematic. Uh, let's go to the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Garden Hotline. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, in a moment, we'll go to the 3-in-1 Plant Garden Hotline. Um, so here's the other thing with the, the and, and with the, the glyphosine, the Roundup. Uh, farmers use this all the time. This is called Roundup Ready soybeans, cotton, uh, clover, uh, corn. You spray it on the field. These co- th- these are genetically modified corn uh, crops. So the DNA has been altered in order to absorb that chemical, the glyphosine, the Roundup. So it kills everything except for the crop in which it was intended to, w- which is growing. So people say, well, we don't want to eat gra- uh, GMO corn. We don't want to eat soy, all that stuff. because, And it's to the level of it's not so much the DNA structure has been altered. It's the chemical that has been sprayed on these crops. That the crops have absorbed that, that glycemic or the, the glyphosine in it, and then you're consuming it. And there's a lot of uh, medical issues that people have said has arise from in- ingesting those chemicals that are in those crops. 
And now the problem that we have in the agricultural world is 20 years ago, everybody was spraying Roundup on their crops. Right. So now, but now it's because these plants are becoming less resistant. The weeds, the weeds are. are. Or the weeds are becoming less resistant to the glyphosate, which is causing things like super weeds to, to grow. So, so what happens then? They go into the, the lab and they create an even more toxic and powerful Roundup or chemical in order to spray. So then they have to go in and alter the DNA, the DNA of these crops to handle that more toxic level of spray in order to kill the weeds and not the crops in which you're, the, the, the farmer is trying to grow. Yeah, it's definitely. And it's an evil cycle. It is an evil cycle. And, and I'm not blaming the farmer for this. This is the box in which they have been put into in most aspects uh, because of the, hey, we'll give you this if you grow this, that type of thing. It's, it's their livelihood. It's either do this or nothing at all, uh, that type of thing. Uh, real quick, let's talk about BioSafe. We talked about a little bit about the first uh, segment. Uh, what is the active ingredient in BioSafe, and why is it not di- uh, as All bad? Right, so Here, BioSafe is um, made with ammonium nanonoate, and it's a, a broad-spectrum contract, contact herbicide that has no soil activity, and it's water-soluble. So what that means is that it's water-soluble, so it's not going to run into your uh, water stream and cause problems. So it, it gets rinsed out with water. And not, non-soil activity means that it's not affecting your soil in a negative way. So it's not killing things in your it's soil. Not, yeah, yeah. So keep that in and mind. And so just, you know, ammonium not, nanonate is made from ammonia and non, nanonic acid. And it's also found in things like apples, grapes, cheese, milk, rice, beans, oranges, potatoes, and other non-food sources. So it's something that exists in nature sure. as is. But it's uh, it's used it's used in a high concentration biosafe. So when uh, just just keep that in mind uh, when you're using chemicals, sometimes the application is, is correct, follow the directions, and sometimes it's not safe at all. Well, when we come back, we're going to go and talk with Marissa, Marissa McClellan, and we'll have her on the program. And she's soon. about uh, canning, all about canning, and uh, on small batch scale. Right after this. TheWisconsinVegetableGardener.com has all the gardening information you need. Videos, digital magazines, replays of shows, and more. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit Plant Success Organics. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. Now with over 450 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, and organic flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round. Pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and garden needs, tools, and special blend fertilizers. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Zaz Products, offering great quality supplements that can help personal health and increase longevity. Committed to bringing you the highest quality products at the lowest price. Find out more at zazproducts.com. Tall Earth Wood Treatment All-in-One Preservative and Stain offers lifetime protection and creates a unique silver-aged wood finish. All ingredients are non-toxic, eco-friendly, perfect for garden beds and veg trunks. Find out more at tallearth.com. Free shipping on all orders. Use coupon code W-I-S-C-O-N-V-E-G to save 15% off orders placed at tallearth.com. 
Shield and Seal Vacuum Sealers, and the highest quality vacuum sealing products, unique black and clear and all black bags, protecting your produce and product better than traditional bags. Find out more at shieldandseal.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from Plant Success Organics.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponic root cutting, seed sprouting, cocoa core, and soil. Plant Success Organics.com carries powder, granule, and tablet form of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil to give your plant the optimal opportunity to produce incredible harvests. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccessOrganics.com. Woodman's is a Wisconsin-based family-owned company founded in 1919. They offer low prices in every single aisle every day. No need to carry a discount card. From produce to meat to international to natural and organic, all offered at the lowest possible prices. Over 60,000 products at every store. Service and savings every day. They're employee-owned to help you save money. They also offer online shopping for pickup and delivery, working to save you more money. Visit woodmans-food.com to find the nearest location. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the following. Handy Safety Knife, BioSafe, Tall Earth, Chapin International, The Plant Booster, Ivy Organics, Woodman's Market, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, your home for Garden Talk Radio with your hosts, Joey and Holly Bay. It's the summertime, and you most times are spending a lot of time outdoors, and you want to make your property look pretty, you, not just for passerbyers, but you want to feel good about where you live, and Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center can help you do this. They've got over 40 varieties of bulk material. You don't necessarily have to have a truck in order to go get it. You can get a, uh, some buckets and a tarp and put it in the back of your car. Wood chips, gravel, sand, if you're still needing to dress up some of your raised beds or uh, you need container mixture, they got that, um, as well as, uh, you know, your ideals for patios and native plants to liven up the backyard. Uh, this is what they do. This is all they do. They don't have, you know, it's not just a couple of kids coming over and playing gardener for a couple of weeks a year. This is who they are. This is what they do. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center, my friends, are the place, is the place to go. They're located at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. They can supply and surpass all of your needs. You can certainly find them on the web at bluemels.com and give them a call at 414-282-4220. Well, Holly, let's go to the IV Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. Marissa McClellan is a full-time food writer and canning teacher and is a voice behind Food in Jars. She is the author of three canning-related books and soon to be another one. And two of her recipes actually won me awards in the Wisconsin State Fair Canning Competition. Welcome to the program, Marissa. Hi there. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Well, thank you for taking time and uh, for uh, and to share some of your canning knowledge with Holly and myself and, and all of our listeners. So you do a lot of small batch canning. There seems to be a misconception you have to can in large amounts. Um, tell us more about the small batch canning. Absolutely. So um, I, I guess, you know, maybe seven or eight years ago, um, I started scaling down recipes. You know, when I first started canning and when I was a kid, we always made big batches. And then... When I was doing it in my own kitchen, it's just my husband and me, and I would make, you know, six pints of jam and then, you know, nine pints of pickles, and I looked around and thought, we can't eat all this, you know, if I want to keep canning. And so I decided to uh, work to cut down recipes and create things that were maybe two or three pints or half pints so that I could continue making things because I loved the process of doing it, but do it in a way where I wasn't producing more more than we could possibly use. And so... um, I often use just, you know, like a quart of produce or a couple pounds as my limiting factor and then create recipes that just use that so that if you shop at the farmer's market or you have a small garden that's not pumping out tons and tons of produce, you can make little batches and still feel really satisfied. Now, with these small batches, is this more uh, keen towards water bath canning or can we also do the small batches in the pressure can form? Um, I'm mostly focused on either water bath canning or dehydrating or fermenting or freezing when I'm doing the small batches. You certainly could fire up the pressure canner for a small batch, but that always feels like a little bit more work. Um, Typically, if I'm going to pull out the pressure canner, and uh, what I might do is do a couple of small batches 
all at the same time that have similar processing times. Like that's how I would scale for um, small batches in the pressure canner. But what I like about the small batches in the water bath canner is that you can then use a smaller canner so you don't have to heat up as much water to process everything and it makes the whole experience go much faster. Right, and there are smaller canners. We've got one, I think it's a five pint or something of that yeah, nature instead of a seven quarter or nine yeah. quarter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes I even use like a little asparagus pot to serve as a small batch canner, you know, because they come with a little rack and they hold, the, you can just do a single pint jar in an asparagus steamer and it you know works really well especially if you're at that point in the summer where the refrigerator is full and even if you made a tiny bet tiny batch and you could just put it in the fridge the fridge is so full with all the stuff coming out of the garden that you just need it to be shelf stable and, and i want to bring up here and i want you to confirm this that people will get the instapot and that is not a safe way of canning on any level that is correct. You cannot can in the Instant Pot. Um, they have said that they're bringing to market a version that you could can in, but they haven't shared any of their data or research as to how they have determined that it is safe for canning. So at this point, um, the National Center for Home Food Preservation and the Ball Company and all the other canning bodies, they have determined that it is not safe to can in any electric multi-cooker or pressure cooker. Well, when people go to, <clears throat> go to your website and read your books, many people may think that you live, uh, you have a large garden and, or some kind of a small hobby farm as you preserve all of this food, but you are not really in those locations. Let everybody know where you actually live and, and how you actually do all this canning. Well, so I live in downtown Philadelphia. I live on the 20th floor of a high rise, so I have, you know, I'm in an apartment. I don't have any outdoor space. Um, I don't even have a community garden plot, um, and I have an 80-square-foot kitchen. So my space is pretty limited, but I look at my limitations just as, you know, something that helps me be creative rather than feeling stuck by them. And, you know, I figure I'm a really good example that if I can do it in my space, anybody can do it. Right, and I'm sure your husband, is. was it a, a team effort that he said, okay, you're going to do this and you're going to save us money and we're going to eat healthier, or was it more of a you had to sell the ideal to him? I had to sell it to him. He, was, he wasn't real interested, um, and to be honest, he is not a huge fan of jam or pickles, which is sort of sad, um, but he does love the corn salsa that I make every summer, and... Um, and he really loves my canning habit when it comes time um, to make gift baskets for his coworkers around the holidays. That's when he's like, ah, yes, I see the utility in this. Definitely. definitely. They do make great gifts. Yes, now, I'm, I'm always curious uh, myself as a, a city girl who learned canning within the last um, half of a decade. How did you get into canning? Well, so I grew up in Portland, Oregon, um, and not in the country. I grew up in, you know, in Portland proper, but Portland is one of those places where blackberries grow wild every summer all over the city and there are apple trees and there's just this abundance of fruit around and so we would make jam every summer and make applesauce in the fall and so I learned to do it from my mom and my mom had learned to do it um, actually in her hippie days <laughs> she was uh, you know like a, in 1970 in San Francisco hippie and um, there was a lot of back to the land stuff at that period of time and so she had learned to do it then and then um, during my childhood called on that knowledge to just make little batches of things and so then when I was in my 20s and in grad school I was living here in Philadelphia by that point and uh, one day I went blueberry picking and I brought home 13 pounds of blueberries because when you pick blueberries, it's just kind of, it's an easy thing to pick and you don't realize how much you're picking until you get home and you think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with 13 pounds of blueberries? And the, the first thing that occurred to me was to make a batch of jam like we'd done when I was a kid. And there was just something about the process of making jam that I loved. I loved the experience of making something and knowing it was going to last. You know, when you make a meal, you have a sort of limited um, period of enjoyment and pleasure from that meal. Whereas when you can something, you get to really relive the the joy of picking that fruit and then making the jam, and you get to experience that, you know, for months. Well, and so that was the, my trigger. That was the thing that got me. Uh, when we do uh, canning demonstrator talks, Holly's got one coming up this week, we get a lot of questions. What is one of the most common questions that you receive when you uh, do your teaching classes on canning? Well, the very most common thing is people want to know, is this safe? Am I going to do any harm to anybody? 
um, by canning. And, you know, I always feel really lucky to be able to put their heart at rest and say, you know, with these high acid preserves like jams and pickles, there's no danger of creating anything um, that could be harmful. You know, if something goes wrong, it's going to be mold or it's going to ferment, and you'll know. So it's really hard to do create something that's dangerous with water bath canning. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. Um, I know a lot of times people get canning burnout, You, especially um, a lot, you know, people who do can larger amounts. By the time October comes, you're like, I don't want to stare at this canner anymore. Do you have any tips on how to avoid canning burnout uh, for us who do, do a lot of canning? Well, um, I would say that it's good to, you know, earlier in the season create a list of things that you really love so that you know what you're looking forward to preparing, so that, you know, if you are feeling burnt out in August, but your very favorite thing is pear vanilla jam, and you think by, you know, September I'm just done, and then you're going to have to live without that pear vanilla jam for months and months. You know, you want to really think about what you love having in your pantry, and often that can help pull you through that burnout. Um, I also think that the small batches are a really good um, way to combat that because if you're not spending hours and hours in the kitchen, um, you can really feel a little bit better about it. And then finally, there's always your freezer. You know, if you're feeling burnt out and you really desperately want to have a particular preserve, you know, put it in the free. Put that, you know, like the tomatoes or the blackberries or whatever you want to make. Put it in the freezer and give yourself a little time to recover before you tackle that next project. Well, and that small batch thing works really, really well if you're creating a batch of something that you've never had before. Like we did cowboy yeah. candy one time, and I think we had to do eight co- eight pints or something. We found out we didn't like it very much because it was too hot. If we would have just done one or two pints, we would have saved a lot of time and not had to find somebody that would want to eat that. Absolutely. Well, you've got two books out. You've got another one coming out. How can people find your books and find more about you and, and uh, questions that they might have in regards to small batch canning? Absolutely. So um, my website is foodinjars.com. So food in, you put the food in the jars. And um, the three books I have out now are available wherever books are sold. If you search for my name, Marisa McClellan, you'll find them. Um, and then the fourth book will be out in April. And I am also on Instagram and Facebook at Food and Jars, so you can find me just about anywhere. And I do lots of live canning demos on Facebook Live throughout the summer. So if people have questions, they can watch live and ask me while I'm canning in my own kitchen, and I'll get back to them. And you're also uh, uh, Instagram as well and and that type of thing. Well, uh, and and with... uh one one last question here. Yeah. With the canning lids, there's two different types of canning lids. There's um, the the old two piece, and then what is the other one, Holly? That that people will the reusable lids. Yeah. yeah. Reusable lids. Is there one that you recommend other more than the other? I typically use the um, disposable two two piece lids because I find that the um, the reusable lids have a higher rate of failure. Um, particularly if you are an inexperienced canner. And then the other reason is that they're expensive. And um, if you want to share your pro- you know, the things you've made with friends and family, you don't want to worry about getting that expensive lid back. Um, so I find that I prefer the, uh, the disposable ones. And the, the reusable ones in large part came up because the disposable ones used to have BPA in the lining, but um, Ball has since removed that. So that concern doesn't exist with the disposable ones anymore. Well, Marissa, we greatly appreciate your time and sharing your canning knowledge with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. When we come back, your garden questions, our garden answers, right after this. If you have a gardening question, now is the time to call in on the IVorganics.com 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline at 414-444-5250. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh used carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cards, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. It's that time to get your lawn lush and green with the Chapin Spreader, the broadcast spreader that outperforms all in their class. 
Get consistent results year after year as if you had hired your own professional lawn service. Find Chapin Spreaders online or order through your local Home Depot, Lowe's, True Value, or Do It Best hardware stores. To see the full line of Chapin lawn and garden products, go to www.chapinmfg.com. This season, arm yourself with the better spreader, Chapin. The Tree Diaper is an advanced plant hydration system. It is an innovative device that captures and holds the water around your plants once full and hydrates them slowly when the plants need it over a period of 30 days. From half to 30 gallon capacity based on your needs. And easy to install even for a first time gardener. The Tree Diaper reduces weeds, protects plants, enhances root growth and prevents overwatering. Whether you're growing trees, vegetables, flowers, house plants, in containers or the ground, your plants will benefit greatly by allowing the Tree Diaper to do the work for you. Find out more at TreeDiaper.com. Made in the USA. Root Assassin, a garden tool that does all the root functions with its advanced shovel that has serrated edges on both sides. Find out more information at RootAssassinShovel.com. Rebel Green, responsibly made natural products that are good for you and the environment. Made in the USA, plant-based, vegan, and always toxic-free. Find out more at RebelGreen.com. Use coupon code WIVEG15 to save 15% off your next purchase at rebelgreen.com forward slash shop. The Handy Safety Knife is a patented, high-quality knife that's worn like a ring, so it's always conveniently at hand. and very easy and efficient to work with. That's why you'll find the Handy Safety Knife at work in a wide range of industries and applications. Learn more at HandySafetyKnife.com. Place an order for your business. Call toll-free, 866-294-3424. Eco Garden Systems is a revolutionary way to grow food, a fully contained raised platform with a conventional watering system, solar power unit optional. Made from recycled material in the U.S., Eco Garden Systems Raised Garden Bed offers sustainable, organic gardening that is environmentally sound, quick and easy to set up, maintain, and fun to use. Fill your garden with soil and plant your seeds. Your Eco Garden will take care of the rest. Can set up in backyard, patio, and even your driveway, any level surface. For more information, visit EcoGardenSystems.com. Use coupon code WIVEG125 to save $125 and get free shipping. A $250 value on the purchase of an Eco Garden original garden unit available only in stone color. Purchases must be made to the website EcoGardenSystems.com forward slash store. Offer valid through December 31st, 2018. Available to the contiguous United States. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mills also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mills today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Haas Tools, Tree Diaper, Root Maker, Seeding Square, Rebel Green, Dripping Springs Oya, Zaz Products, Shield and Seal, Pomona Universal Pectin. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Julie and Holly Baird. It is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, or radio show. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, we have the, our uh, call in line open if you have a question. Uh, we're open the whole show, but it's 414-444-5250. It's sponsored by Ivy Organic. Ivy Organic from in Plant Garden naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. We had a question come in about... Canning uh, here, about since we've talked about the canning. I have a decent supply of asparagus I got from the farmer's market. Uh, I love asparagus. And and I saw a video. I, I saw this video and thought I'd try it. Every time I've tried to make dill pickled or, or any a, pickles, any pickles, they end up being be mushy. mushy. What, how, what's what's going on with this? So when you're using um, any any vegetable to pickle it, 
You want to use it fresh, and you want to work fast. If you let that stuff sit in the brine for too long, it's going to get mushy. If you boil it for too long, it's going to get mushy. You want to work with, with fresh vegetables and, and fast, and you want to do it in smaller batches. Yeah, instead of using a quart, or a quart, do a pint jar because the processing time is much shorter, and you don't have that much heat. You know, the heat is minimal. Now, if you, can, if you do refrigerator pickles, you don't really necessarily have this problem uh, when it comes to uh, that. Let's go to the Ivy Organics 3 one Plant Guard Hotline Caller. You're on the air. Well, thank you for taking my call. Good morning, Mr. Joel. Thank you. Good, good morning. Good morning, uh, good, good morning Ms., uh, Ms. Bear. Good morning. And good morning, Milwaukee. Good morning, uh, Mr. Debo. A uh, couple different things. I know the woman has spoke about the, um, the jarring and the canning there, and um, she, she mentioned the, um, uh, I guess it was mold. So basically, a c- couple, because uh, I know I don't do jelly anymore, so I know my preserves and my jams, they're pretty much gone before, but I've, uh, uh, for, for, for the uh, couple times that I've seen family members that eat jelly and jelly's in the refrigerator, and it's not so much that the refrigerator has failed us, but uh, mold has started to grow inside the jar. And even some of the, the butter dish, you know, if it, I'm like, you know, you got to eat this here before too long because, you know, they'll let it sit for two or three weeks and mold, excuse me, mold, mold starts to grow on it. So I know that um, sometimes, I know they said the penicillin came from um, a, a, a d- different strand of mold or something, so that, or uh, or bacteria there that uh, was helpful in the medical field there. So what's the difference between um, different funguses? What, you know, uh, is, is, is mold and um, is mold, what's the difference between moss, mold, and different funguses? Um, what, what's the other one I'm looking for there? Um, moss? So, yeah, okay. so like stuff like fungus, mold, moss, they're all within the same family. They're actually decomposers. So what they do is they um, they take what's in the air and they take whatever they're sitting on and they eat that and they feed off of bacteria. So that's what the difference is. It just depends on where it's growing, how it's growing, and where it came from. So I, I know that uh, we, we're not to eat those, but uh, can, can, can the medical profession uh, do a little bit more with those as opposed to those being thrown away then? And I'll listen to you over, over the air. Thank you very much then. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I assume the medical profession is probably working on stuff of, of that level. Oh, yeah, they came up with penicillin, which was basically a uh, positive bacteria that became um, an antibacterial uh, remedy. And some people are uh, allergic to, to that. Right, well, they have other antibiotics out there. Another question that came in, so I'm growing a watermelon. Can I cut back the growth tips to contain the plant and make the fruit bigger? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can, and you can do the same for pumpkins as well. Uh, you're going to uh, f- clip off all the developing fruit until you have about two or three per vine, and that way it's not going to try to produce nine watermelons the size of baseballs. It will produce, and obviously it's based on the variety of, of watermelon too. Uh, it will produce, you know, larger melons, and you cr- cut back that growth tip just like you do tomatoes to comp- uh, compress it, so it stresses it out a little bit and, and puts more energy into the fruit production rather than the growth cycle of that particular uh, 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 plant. Uh, so that's a thing. And we did this with pumpkins a couple of years ago and, and worked very well on our, right. jar, our Jardale pumpkins in, in, this, in your yeah, my sister's, sister's backyard. backyard. They definitely grew very nicely, and we were able to, to get a, a nice growth 45 from Forty-five pounds of pumpkins. Which was three pumpkins. These Jardell pumpkins are a gray pumpkin. I think that some people label them as. An but Australian. even before that, um, our niece and nephew got those uh, jack o' lantern type pumpkins that they were able to carve and paint for uh, for fall fun. Yeah, and we we did that. But again, yeah, watermelon. Uh, you can probably do this. I'm not certain, but I would assume the same technique would hold true on your uh, butternut, your spaghetti, uh, your acorn squash. I don't see why not. It's but those are, those are pretty variety. quick and heavy producers to begin with, so you really have to uh, worry too much. I'm uh, with these larger fruit productions, the watermelons and the pumpkins, you want to have you know large. You don't want to have small things uh, growing into your, uh, you know, you want a large harvest. All right, next question. When is the proper time to harvest horseradish? I planted a start this spring. When can I harvest it? Well, you want to harvest it in the fall after the first frost. Now, you can harvest it, really, the old saying is any Month that ends in er, so October, November, December. Well, around here, by the middle of November, the ground is pretty frozen. Sometimes you can't see the ground. So uh, first frost in October, harvest it one time. You don't want to uh, remove 
the whole plant. You want to leave some for regeneration, but uh, it'll look like a uh, white carrot is what the the resemblance of the root is going to look like. And you can actually physically eat that horseradish just like you would a carrot, and you're not going to have that heat that you normally associate horseradish with. Now, when that heat occurs is whenever you shred it and expose it to oxygen. That's when the chemical reaction occurs, and that's when you get that heat that many of us are familiar with horseradish. But uh, plant it in spring, harvest it in the fall after the first frost, and you can get many uh, years out of horseradish. Uh, can you explain more about how you make your weed tea? Weed as being weeds that we harvest from the garden that are growing abundantly. So what we've done is we've taken a 30, 40 gallon tote. You can use a bucket. You can use a trash can. Fill it full of the weeds that you've harvested and then top it off with water and let it steep there. You don't need air bubblers. You don't need any of that. What is occurring is the leaching of the nutrients out of the weeds. And uh, it is, there's some rot going on there. And it absorbs into the water. And then you take that water and you feed the plants, water it normally. Now, it does, if, if any of you have ever drove by a farm, uh, when you get close to this concoction that you've made with the weed and the water, it has the smell of... A farm, a uh, cattle, a cattle lot, but it has a very large nutrient rich liquid concentrate that you can water. Uh, we do 100%. We just dip it right out of there and we water the plants. Uh, it's great for the plants, great for the, the fee, uh, foliar feed. Just put it on everything. Uh, and if you're concerned about the smell, you can do it uh, a day before a day of a rain, but you want to utilize this. Now you can use Mupu tea. Uh, you can use the compost tea bags from Purple Cow Organics. But again, all combinations of, of these type of materials work great. But we find that uh, we've experimented with the weed tea. And, and then, then people will say, well, what do you do with the contents that you've left over, the, the grasses that are dead and, and broke down? We just throw in the compost pile. And if, if it does have a smell to it, you can certainly mix it into the compost pile uh, so you don't have to deal with the, the flies that we find that come to that container. Uh, but again... Uh, any type of weeds work. Uh, it doesn't matter if they contain seeds or whatever. We want, to, And you can do this with grass clippings too, but you want to make sure they're chemical-free grass clippings so you don't have any leaching of chemicals into the garden that can cause problems throughout the season. That will wrap the show up. We greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us in the program, participating, listening. We hope that we uh, provided information that will be applicable for your particular growing situation. Uh, join us next week. We're going to talk about foliar feeding as well as plant problems. And our first ever in-studio guests, they're going to be with us for the entire program. They are the host of the and co-host of the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki uh, from WGCN out of Evanston, Illinois. Uh, Mike Novak and Peggy Malecki will be with us for the entire program in studio, so that will be a treat. Uh, they have a lot of information that they, they can bring to the table. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it its entirety, you can certainly do that by going to the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and clicking on the radio tab at the top of the page. Want a specific interview or individual segment from past shows, you can do that under the highlight tab on the main page of the same website. Well, until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. You've been listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Tell a friend and join Joey and Holly again next week so we can all grow together. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com in association with WI Garden Media Broadcast, live from the WNOV 860 AM and the W293CX 106.5 FM, Courier Communications Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.